in an effort to combat the temptation and theological, historical, and cultural influences that drive people to put their trust in wealth, and we're in the section where Colette's been demonstrating wealth's foible, how it, it's not worth our trust. It, it just can't do for us what only God can do for us. And, and I've said it over and over, but that section um, is in chapter 5, verse 10, all the way through the end of chapter 6. That'd be verse 12 of chapter 6. And in the previous section, we discovered really kind of the prognosis um, if a person puts their trust in riches. This is kind of what happens. This is the, the kind of sickness that it would bring about. And we learned last week that it would hurt them spiritually, hurt them emotionally, and hurt them physically. So trusting in wealth brings about certain types of hurts. And it's really the broad spectrum of hurt for us spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And then in the next section, Coalette describes how wealth can be helpful rather than hurtful. Um, he basically been speaking of wealth not necessarily negatively, but in a way negatively, as if you put your trust in it's a very negative thing. So now he's going to speak about wealth kind of positively and how it can be beneficial. If his readers will simply recognize some important things about riches, and ultimately, it'd be like repentance and recognition. You know, recognize some things about riches, repent of trusting in wealth. If they would do that, then they would begin to see wealth and riches as beneficial and helpful to their lives, as they're intended to be. And so this morning, we're going to look at the vanity and dangers of trusting in wealth, part three. And we're going to focus on observations seven, eight, and nine. I think originally I was going to have about 10, but I might be up to 11 or 12 now because you don't ever have the full blueprint until you start getting into the text. Please take your Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes. And we're going to look at the very last chunk in chapter 5. Uh, chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, that will wrap up the chapter. I want to pray for the Spirit's help before we get to work. Lord, uh, we just pray that... Uh, we know your spirit is with us here. It's in your, he's in your people, and, but we just pray that uh, the spirit would uh, maybe manifest divine power in a special way today to really work in our hearts and to help us understand, once again, the foible of riches, but then to, you know, and that's when we're trusting in them, to help us understand that, you know, again, they're not worth trusting in. And if we treat them properly and see them properly and recognize them as they're intended to be recognized, they can be very beneficial to our lives, to the lives of others, to the church and these things. And it's kind of reminded, Lord, right now in this moment just of how you've given so many good things to us. And we tend to take those good things and turn them into bad things through excess or misunderstanding. And so, and that's, that's a classic case of this in the text. So just help us to see... The, benef the beneficial part of wealth and riches. Help us to come to these, rec um, to recognize these things and uh, to apply them to our lives. And so may the Spirit prevail upon us today in the way He does it, which is perfect, and that's in love and with gentleness and with power. And so work in our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We can pick up where we left off last Sunday and look at my seventh observation. This is just really, really simple stuff. So the first thing we must do if we want to develop a healthy view of, of riches and, and uh, kind of move forward into that, we've got to recognize the strategy of riches. Or maybe another way to put it would be the plan for riches, the design for riches. Riches, uh, all things come to us from God, and God has an intention and design for them. And so if we can recognize the strategy or the plan, we can begin to move in the right direction. And we see this in verse 18a. And let me just say this as a disclaimer. Um, through this whole series, we've been uncovering a lot of things that I'm convinced that Coalette would not be aware of. And so it's, it's not that we're taking his teachings and twisting them to mean something else. When Coalette wrote what he wrote, he was under the old covenant, under an old system, and didn't have the resource and revelation that we have. And so when I teach these things, some of the things that I'm saying may not perfectly square with what the little commentary in your, your study Bible might say. And so it's not that I'm teaching falsely or going beyond what's meant. It's that we have the New Testament. 
we have the revelation of Christ, and that helps to put the cap and full meaning to what we're reading. And so I, I just said that as a disclaimer because I know that you know, sometimes I read in a commentary and they only stop at Coalette's perspective, which stops short and might not be as helpful to us as it could be. We need to include Christ. Amen? Amen. Right. So, no, I'm not a false teacher. Okay? Although I can teach falsely at times, I would admit, right? Because I'm a man. And then I repent and do all that. So, moving on. Recognize the strategy of riches. What are they intended for? Why do we have them? What are they for? Verse 18a, and this is what Coalette says next. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life. Okay. According to Coalette... Toil and the fruit of toil, which would be wealth or riches, have a good and fitting purpose. And this is like the first time he's said anything like this. He's been talking about how detrimental and dangerous wealth can be. And now he's saying, well, it, it actually has a good and fitting purpose. Working hard and, and making the money, it, there's a good purpose behind that, is what he's saying. He's saying there's a strategy behind riches and toil that lead to riches. There's a strategy there. And, and in a sense, what he's saying is, is riches can be put toward a great many things, including the simple pleasures in life, which he captures with the idea of eating and drinking. Now, I would say that eating and drinking can be a simple pleasure in life, but they're also a necessity because those who don't eat and drink don't live. But when he says it here, he's not talking about bread and water like prison food, the bare essentials. He's talking about something that you could participate in with, you know, for enjoyment, for a sense of pleasure. And maybe he, what he's saying is that you, know, you can participate with a little bit of good wine or maybe some food that's at another level. Go to do's, so to speak. I don't know if it's any good. It used to be when Scott had it. So, so he's saying that you know, there, is, there is a strategy behind riches, in, and, it, and it's a good and fitting strategy. He's not talking about trusting in them, because that's not the strategy for riches. They're meant for, in a sense, to lead to enjoyment, is what he's saying, eating and drinking. Consider his logic, because this is what he's been arguing all along in chapter 5. If riches are amassed... You just keep stacking them and stacking them and stacking them and building the portfolio and building, you know, the accounts and these sorts of things. If they're just always amassed to where you're like Fort Knox got piles and piles of riches, and yet they're never invested in things that we actually enjoy, and then you can't take the riches with you upon death, what's the point to having riches at all? Amen? What is the point? Is it part of that philosophy, the 80s philosophy of he who dies with the most toys wins? I don't know how he wins because the toys don't go with you. You don't ride the quad in death. So, right? The electric bike doesn't mean anything. The explorer doesn't mean anything. I mean, whatever it is that you have, it's meaningless in death. It's vanity. And so what Colette's basically saying is that there's a strategy behind toil and riches in Part of that strategy is for your enjoyment, to participate in things that are good and fitting. And yes, the Bible would teach that something that is good and fitting would be moderate wine use and fine food. You know, some people think that as soon as you mention alcohol or whatever, now we're talking about alcoholism. Well, no, 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 we're not talking about alcoholism. We're not talking about abuses. We're talking about, it talks about in scripture of wine warming the belly and these sorts of things. Wine can have a medicinal purpose. Somebody had a stomach ache in scripture and somebody said drink a little wine with it. I don't know how that would help. Maybe get your mind off it. But, right, you know, I, usually when I have a stomach ache, I'm not thinking about alcoholic beverages. Maybe it's because of an alcoholic beverage I have a stomach ache because I drank a, I don't know, a dark beer that's like eating a loaf of rye bread. <laughs> Point being that they're not intended to be amassed wealth. It's intended to be utilized. You have one life. One life. What good does it do for you to die with all of that? Because you know what? 
A little later, he argues how it's going to go to someone who will enjoy it. <laughs> you didn't enjoy it. You died. But your kid over here, who's basically borderline an oxygen thief, not referring to my kids, is going to get all of it and have a great time with it. They're going to enjoy it. Yeah. So this is really, really good logic that he's espousing for us here. So, so if you're all about amassing and dying with a fortune, then you have to ask this question. Is that what life is about? Is life about being born and working hard and saving and then just dying? Is that the purpose of life? He who dies with the most toys. See, you, that statement wouldn't even apply here because if somebody's dying with a lot of toys, it sounds like they enjoyed the toys while they were alive. This is not what Colette's talking about. He's talking about someone who li lives as if they were born to save and die, never enjoying any of the spoil of their hard work. So according to the question, are we merely born to work, save, and die, Colette's answer would be absolutely not. No. No. Life is meant to be lived, and riches are intended for living. Did you hear me? Life is intended to be lived. Riches are for that purpose. And if all you do is save and hoard and build, that's what you're living for, and that's not life to the fullest. You're not enjoying anything. And, of course, you could argue the other extreme. All this person does with their riches is enjoy, and they're never serious or you know, responsible. Now, that would be equally anathema, foolish. Life is meant to be lived. Riches are intended or meant for living. And I would say as a Christian for helping others. And my, my wealth is part of the kingdom of God and it, it, it belongs ultimately to God. And so I should use it, yes, for my own living and maybe to help others who, who can't live in a certain way. I'm not saying I got to get them up to my level or something, but, you know, if, if somebody needs a sandwich... Now, when we view riches in the way that he's talking about here, that some of it is meant for your enjoyment, such as, you know, food and drink, drink and food. It doesn't have to be wine. It can be Dr. Pepper. If you're Robin, she's going to, you know, buy an extra 18-pack of Dr. Pepper. Fine. It's enjoyable. It's pure sugar. Why not? Actually, it's pure corn syrup. So it's for enjoyment. Now, when you begin to understand this, when you begin to get this, when we begin to view riches in this way, we can begin to find enjoyment in our toil under the sun. Right? Let me give you an example. Okay? Because I know how we all are at times. Oh, work. Ugh, pfft, I hate it. I don't want to go to work. When you're in your early 20s, you know, you're... you're healthy as can be, and all of a sudden you're dying, and you got to call in. And then, like at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when you're supposed to be at work, you're at the mall, right? And then somebody from work sees you, and the party's over. Work, I know. It can be a drag. It can feel like a drag. It can be tiresome it, 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 if it's repetitive. If you work at uh, the, the cork factory at, at, at Gallo, you're Mr. Cork, uh, i got to go make corks tomorrow. I don't want to make corks. Let me give you an example, though, of how you can find enjoyment in work. Okay, if I want to take a trip, okay, I'm not talking about a 60s trip, you know. I'm talking about if I want to take an actual trip. I knew Shelly would get that. <laughs> Shelly's like, I took a lot of trips, and I never left. Daryl, too. Um... <laughs> If I want to take a trip, let's say, I want to get a break, you know, I want to, maybe I want to zip off somewhere to like Monterey. Oh, by the way, when I go on a trip at 54, I want to relax and enjoy myself. Disneyland is not relaxing and enjoying myself. Disneyland is me getting mad at a lot of people in my way because I'm trying to get a dang Dole Whip. I got 75 people from another country in front of me and I'm like, I'm not getting the Dole Whip. I can't even tell these people I want the Dole Whip. They don't understand me. That's not relaxing. You're putting in 20, 30,000 steps a day. Rachel's like, this is the best thing in the world. I'm like, I'm dying over here. I'm fat, out of shape. <laughs> if I want to take a trip and I want to relax and enjoy myself, I do like to go to Disneyland, by the way, but 
and I need to save for it, right? I can't just go and take this trip. I need to work, and I need to save for it. If I, if, if I know that there's something like that on the, on the horizon, it's not too far out. Like, you know, I'm going to take a trip in five years. There's no motivation there. I'm taking the trip in, in uh, let's see, what are we in right now? We're going into September, right? I'm taking a trip in October, and i got to work for it. I am much more enthusiastic about going to work. Amen? I don't mind going to work because there's a carrot out there on the end of the string. I'm like, yeah, I'm working. Sure, I'm working, I'm responsible, I'm paying my bills, I'm thankful to the Lord for this, but I got something to look forward to. I got two days in Monterey to look forward to. And I know that's gonna consist of me eating at Fishwife, woohoo! Me walking on the beach with my snaggle tooth feet, woohoo! Me maybe smoking a nice stogie down there, right? Enjoying myself, relaxing. Oh man, are you kidding me? I'm kind of pumped to work. In fact, I might even pray, Lord, could you send me some more DJ work, right? I might pray for that. I might pray for the provision. Lord, could you provide a way so I can go get some rest, so I can Sabbath, so I can go with my wife? I'm much more motivated to go to work when there is something enjoyable on the horizon. This is exactly what Coalette's talking about. This is where riches have a good and beneficial purpose. Because I'll tell you what, especially in this day and age, some people would say, well, all you got to do is pack a little lunch and drive over to Monterey and have a good time. It doesn't cost you a whole lot. Well, that may be true, although a bag lunch is probably $39.95 these days, and you still got $200 in gas. Nothing's cheap. It is expensive to enjoy yourself and have a good time. I'm going to have to work. But at least I have something to look forward to, and I'm motivated and I'm enthusiastic about it. I enjoy my work. I enjoy my toil. When I'm down there chilling on the beach, I'm enjoying the, pro I'm even thankful for the process that got me down there. Because as I was saying just two seconds ago, I'm not going down there unless I work and make the money because it's too expensive. I have to work. I have to do something to have the income to go down there. And it isn't that expensive, but it's still something. Now on the way down there, I'd be praying that my vehicle stays together, right? It's just what happens when you have high mileage cars. If I know in a month's time I'm going to be eating and drinking at Fishwife and doing these things, man, I'm going to do a good job at work. Why is that? Because many vacations are enjoyable to me, and work and riches make them possible. There's the positive. Enjoyment, therefore, becomes a motivator for toil and riches. I can have, they can help me, they can help bring about enjoyment in my life. They can help me engage in things that I find to be enjoyable. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is a positive benefit to riches. Oh, I just think riches are evil and bad and the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Well, there's, there's some truth to that, but they have a strategy behind them and it's a good one. You just have to understand it. Okay, understand this distinction. Okay, riches, according to Coalette here, in the very tiny last section of five, they're for our enjoyment. What he's been arguing this whole time prior to this moment, now he's saying they're for our enjoyment. But prior to that, he's been saying all along, they're not for our fulfillment. Therein lies the difference. Fulfillment is in Christ only. Never in riches. The man who loves money will never be satisfied by money. He just said that in verse 10. So therefore, our enjoyment, what I can do with them can bring enjoyment. No matter how much of it I have, it's never going to bring real satisfaction or fulfillment. Therein lies the difference. That's the message of Ecclesiastes. So, he who loves money is not going to be satisfied by money, chapter 5, verse 10. But he who uses money is a tool for many good things, including his or her own personal enjoyment. They are going to experience a much more enjoyable life. There is really nothing enjoyable about a life of amassment because you're not taking the time to smell the roses and to enjoy the fruit of your labor. This is exactly what he's arguing. Amen? Amen. Riches are for our enjoyment. They are not 
for our fulfillment. And the person who recognizes this and invests some of it in their enjoyment is going to have a much more enjoyable life. But the person who amasses and saves and dies with a fortune, they didn't even enjoy putting it together. You know how hard it is to save? You know how hard it is to amass riches? It takes an enormous amount of work and stress and anxiety and everything. That's not quality of life. And then you just die and it all goes to someone else who didn't earn it? No. That's, that sounds like a type of hell to me. That doesn't sound like living. Understand that Jesus came enjoying life. Well, he's our Savior. He came to die for our sins and all that. Yeah, but he enjoyed himself leading up to the cross. Oh, no, he didn't. Yes, he did. What do you think? He just came down and I'm just, I, I can't talk to you. I got to die. I can't. He came enjoying life. He, he enjoyed life to the point that the religious hypocrites of his day, they witnessed him eating <clears throat> and drinking. And on one occasion, they said, look at him. He's a glutton. He's a drunkard. He's a friend of the worst sinners in society, Luke 7, 34. They criticized him because he claimed to be the Messiah, and here he is hanging out with people that weren't worth saving and engaging in things that they themselves engaged in but didn't think he should engage in, eating and drinking. Jesus was not what they charged him to be. He was not a glutton. He was not a drunkard. But he did enjoy eating and drinking. And he did enjoy spending time with the dregs of society. He's like a doctor, isn't he? The well don't need a doctor. The sick do. He said this. He spent time with the sick, not those who think they're well and righteous. We call him the great physician. Doctors heal and heal people. They even save people from death at times. They give a right diagnosis and a right treatment. Somebody's been delivered from physical death. Doctors do this stuff all the time. And this is, in a sense, what Dr. Jesus came to do. He came to make spiritually dead people alive and to give those who trust in him an abundant life. At one point, he told his disciples this. The devil's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. The devil doesn't exist to give us a good life. He exists to destroy our lives. And Jesus said, my purpose is to give my sheep a rich and satisfying life. John 10.10, 10, that's from the NLT. A rich and satisfying life. That's how the translators of the NLT rendered, I've come to give them an abundant life. Rich and satisfying. So the life that Christ gives is a life of joy and enjoyment. It really is. Oh, you're starting to sound like one of those charismatics health and wealth addicts. Not at all what I'm saying. Some of us act like we've been baptized in prune juice and we're just ticked off all the time. That can be me at times. That is not the life that Christ came to give. You've been saved from your sin. You ought to be the happiest schmuck in the world. Think about it. He came to give us a... a, a a life of joy in him, a life of enjoyment in him. Things that we have are meant for our enjoyment, meant for his purposes as well. And our enjoyment is one of his purposes. Even during storms, the storms of life, it is biblical to set aside riches for our enjoyment. Ecclesiastes 2.24. It is biblical to be responsible with riches. Matthew 25.14-30. These are just reference verses. There's many more you could go to. Lastly, it is biblical to invest our time, talent, and treasure in the church for the building up of the body of Christ. 1 Peter 4.10, Ephesians 4.12. Riches are meant for all of these things. Not one or the other. Not one and none of the others. For all. Enjoyment is one of them. Oh, it's sinful to enjoy. No. Your enjoyment can turn into sin. I think we would all agree that riches are to be held or handled wisely, right? It takes some wisdom to handle riches, and it's challenging at times. They need to be budgeted and balanced, but never to the point of zero enjoyment. Never. Don't, you know, great example is Dickens, right? Scrooge? There's someone who had a lot and didn't enjoy anything until a bunch of ghosts visited him, helped him realize that his path wasn't right. Then on Christmas Day, he's exploding, and I wish I'd been walking down below his window. Throw me a goose. 
So, so there is a strategy for riches, and part of that strategy is for our enjoyment. And yet trusting in riches, which is something else he's been arguing, it's vanity and dangerous. It leads to hoarding. It leads to hurt. It leads to zero enjoyment. If you're trusting in riches, and riches are so volatile, volatile here today, gone tomorrow, they're so unstable, how are you going to have enjoyment when you're putting your trust in something that's not stable? This is why you have to put your trust in the Lord, Jesus Christ, because he's the only stable person you really know. He's more stable than your spouse. Amen? Amen. Don't you say that. <laughs> Just kidding. Rachel's like, this is the first time he's ever preached truth. <laughs> Trusting in riches is vanity and dangerous. It can lead to hoarding. It can lead to stacking, amassing. It can lead to wrongful spending. It can lead to zero enjoyment, pure stress. All the things he's listed in the previous section. Talk about the hurt that it causes, emotional, physical, spiritual. Come on now, people. Ultimately, if you're not enjoying some of what you've toiled for, as Coalette's speaking of here, you're now defeating the strategy of riches, which part of it is enjoyment. You know, there, there is an example of, of people in, um, in antiquity that were doing this, biblically, I should say, in Ephesus. Of course, in Coalette's day, which was prior to Ephesus, it was happening. That's why he wrote this. But the church at Ephesus, there were members in that church that were doing this very thing that he's talking about here, where they, 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 they were mishandling riches, and trusting in them, and jacking their lives up, hurting the church. Paul commanded Pastor Timothy to do this, to teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. 1 Tim 6, 17, that's your NLT. For our enjoyment. If you can't enjoy, just as a rule of thumb, if you can't enjoy a portion of your riches. If, if, if your riches are there and you find no enjoyment in them, you have a wrong view of riches. You're missing it. You don't understand. You're not taking any of it and investing in, in good things that would be good for you. It's not sinful to take a, a, a weekend trip to Monterey. It could become sinful if you get hammered on Saturday night. There's a difference. Paul's exhortation is phenomenal. Listen to this. The, la the last words, who richly gives, speaking of God, 1 Tim 6, 17, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. That's the way the NLT renders it. And it's a perfectly fine rendering. I've been using the NLT because it's just so boiled down so well. So the question we have to ask after reading that, who gives us all things for our enjoyment, the end of Paul's exhortation there, does, did it, would it include actual riches? Are those meant for our enjoyment? All things, it says. So I think the answer is yes. Riches are part of the all we need for our enjoyment. The riches themselves shouldn't bring enjoyment. If they do, that shows that we're trusting in them. It's what riches can do. It can fund a vacation. It can fund something that I can bring into my home that, that brings me enjoyment. It can fund something that brings my wife enjoyment. It can fund something that brings Steve enjoyment. A lunch out. Amen? Where are you taking me? I wasn't talking about me taking you. I need riches to do that. So all we need for our enjoyment, riches would be included in that. God means and is, is so awesome in his sovereignty and power that he literally bends, conforms, maneuvers, manipulates all things, especially the terrible things, together to somehow be for our good. Bad experiences are meant for our good. Good experiences are meant for our good. Enjoyable experiences are meant for our good. Obviously, the thing that's hanging above all of that is the glory of God. God intends for everything to, renown, to redound for his glory and for our good. Do you believe that about the Lord? Then you need to start seeing your riches as part of that. I'm not, we're, not talk, we're not talking about abuses. <laughs> Lastly, notice the little warning at the end of verse 18a. The few days of his life. 
speaking of this rich man. Colette is saying that life is too short to be, to be spent, invested in vain and dangerous things like trusting in wealth. Life is short. Comparatively speaking to eternity, which is forever, life is nothing. It's a vapor, as James says. It's transient. It's here today, gone tomorrow. Life is too short to be misplacing our trust or to be abusing the things that are meant for our enjoyment. It's, it's, it's not, life itself is not for that. It's too short for that. Life is meant to be enjoyed, and riches are meant to serve that purpose, among other purposes. You know what a wasted life is? A life of savings and amassment. Unless somehow you spent your whole life doing that so you could get to a point where you could actually enjoy it. We call it retirement. Maybe that's okay. But at least you're going to live off of and enjoy what you toiled for. That's different. We're talking about someone who just takes it with, tries to take it with them. That's not happening. Life is to be enjoyed. It's short. It's to be enjoyed. It's to be rendered unto service to God, which should be enjoyable. It's to be invested in things that we find enjoyable that aren't sinful. Riches should serve that purpose. The Bible says that we should make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Ephesians 5, 15 to 16. How do we do this? Well, it says in the next couple lines, by understanding what the will of the Lord is. And if you read a little further, I think it has to do with living a life that is pleasing to him. Now, if we were to take that bit of wisdom in Ephesians 5, which I think is brilliant, and apply it to our text, it means that we should make the most of our opportunity because we have only a few days. And how would we do that in our context? By enjoying some of our riches. Hello. Not hoarding, not reckless spending, something invested in some level of enjoyment. Take a break from work. Go sit on a beach. Put a little money, invest a little bit of money in your own enjoyment. That's not selfish. That's nar not narcissistic. It would only be selfish and narcissistic if that's all you do. I don't pay my bills, but no, that's not responsible. You know, we live in a fallen world. It's a rough place. We're only here for a short amount of time, which I think is probably more of a blessing than anything. We should make the most of every opportunity. We should be spreading the gospel. We should be investing in the kingdom of God. We should be investing in our own benefit and enjoyment that's holy and pleasing to God. How are you going to... You know that if you're not enjoying some level of life and filled with joy because of the things you're able to engage in, how can you worship God without enjoyment? You know, enjoyment's an emotion. It's a powerful emotion. And the, 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 the enjoyment and God are tied together. It's your enjoyment of him that's true worship. And that may come through some riches or something that you have to invest in your enjoyment. God is to be worshipped in all things, even in our enjoyment. In fact, I don't think you can really have enjoyment apart from him because he's the source of all joy. We'll talk about that. Investing some riches in opportunity for holy enjoyment. That's what we should do. Eating and drinking in moderation, going to Monterey, so on. Maybe a Disney trip. It's not all that restful, but it can be very fun. Or maybe you're not into Disney. Maybe you'd rather go to Six Flags and ride something that's going to make your stomach come out your ear. Fine. But if you, if you don't do any of these things, if you don't seek out opportunity, invest in opportunity for holy enjoyment, uh, it's, you know, if you treat riches like an idol, you're not going to have enjoyment. No, no enjoyment or satisfaction or anything comes from the worship of idols, whether it be wealth or sex or anything else. There's pleasure in it, but it's carnal pleasure. There's no enjoyment. We spend all our time adoring and adorning money rather than putting it to good use. It becomes like Dagon in a Philistine temple. It's a false god. The Philistines worship. That's what ends up happening. First Sam 5, 2. Do you know that we are to master our riches? Hmm? The person who trusts in riches is being mastered by riches. They're not mastering their riches. They're being mastered by their riches. There's a huge difference. Riches have power over them. 
You're to have power over your riches. You have dominion over your money. We don't serve riches, they serve us. But if you're trusting in them, they become your God and you're in full service to them. This is exactly what happens. It's what he's been talking about all along. We are not mastered, not to be mastered by our riches. We're, not, we're to be masters of our riches, not mastered by our riches. We don't serve riches, they serve us. But if a person trusts in riches, the order is reversed. Money becomes a cruel idol that demands full devotion. Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve God and money. You'll love one and hate the other. You can't worship money and worship God. You have to choose. The rich young ruler made a choice and walked away, still worshiping his money. The order gets flipped around if we're trusting in riches. And the owner, as we have just learned last week and in the previous weeks, they're going to destroy themselves spiritually, emotionally, and physically in service to a phony, fake little God called riches. And when they die, the idol they cherished their whole life is going to be removed, gone. And they will be judged, and they will be cast into hell to pay for their idolatry, to pay for their sins. It's a, it's a terrible thing. Trusting in anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ is is the most dangerous thing anyone could ever do for the Christian, for that unbeliever. So the first thing we must do here is recognize the strategy of riches or for riches. Among other things, they are intended for our enjoyment. Let's move to my eighth observation. Eight, recognize the source of riches, verses 18b through 19a. I'll read that text real quick. He just says that God has given him for this is his lot. He's still speaking of the guy that had the riches and all that, and he should be enjoying them. He says, now that God has given him these riches, and this is his lot. And then he says in 19a, everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to, the power to enjoy them. What Colette basically does here is he identifies the source of riches as God. That's where they come from. He wrote, God has given him. He wrote, God has given wealth and possessions. God is the sovereign giver. God is the providential provider of all things, including riches. They come from him. They come from his hand. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, which is a metaphor for literally everything in creation, anything that you could ever imagine. He owns it all. Psalm 50.10 and because he is loving, merciful, and gracious, he has chosen to share his estate because all things, all creation is his estate. Because he's loving and merciful and gracious in these things, these wonderful things, he has chosen to share his estate with fallen, sinful humanity. Not just believers, everyone. Because he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, Matthew 5, 45. We know also that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows, James 4, 17. Everything is coming from God to the believer and to the unbeliever alike. The one thing that's not coming to the unbeliever is salvation, unless God actuates that. Point is, God is the source. Everything comes from him. We have to recognize this. We're never going to have a proper perspective of riches if we don't understand what they're intended for, their strategy, nor where they come from. W where does somebody in here work? Tell me where you work. Tell me where you work, Carlos. He works for Food for Less. You're a buyer, right, or a, a purchaser. Newsflash, your money doesn't come from Food for Less. Food for Less doesn't have a dime without the Lord's provision. The Lord provides for you through Food for Less. The riches that you have in your account. He's probably thinking, I don't know if they're riches. There's a little bit of money in there. Whatever it is, understand they're coming from the Lord. And this is one of the biggest things that people wrestle with. I worked for my money. <laughs> you don't understand the bigger picture. You don't have a job without the Lord. I don't believe in him. It doesn't matter. I don't believe in Half Dome. It's still there. I can take you up there. Let's go for a two-hour drive. I'll show it to you. Oh, what is that big old thing? That's called half dumb. Half dumb. 
He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He, he, he gives to the just and the unjust. Everything is literally coming from him. If we don't recognize this, we're, we're never going to have a proper perspective or understanding of riches, ever. Take special notice of the phrase at the end of verse 18b. He says, for this is his lot. He's referring to the riches that he has and to even his enjoyment of the riches. He's saying, for this is his lot. What is a lot? Is it a parking lot? Is it a house, housing lot? What is he talking about here? Is it the guy that's wife got turned into salt, you know, Mrs. Saltine? No. Lot refers to our station in life, and more particularly to our families, to our pets, to our friends, homes, stuff, careers, whatever it is that we have in our life, however our life is going, whatever our life is in any given moment is our lot, L-O-T. God is not only the sources or the source of our riches, he is the source of our lot. He sovereignly placed the people that you have in your lives, even the ones that are tough, he sovereignly placed where you live and where you go. He sovereignly placed the possessions that you have and that you hopefully enjoy to some degree and that you're also responsible with. It's all come from him. He has determined your lot. Because of this, we mustn't stress or strain over our lives, over our lot. We cannot worry nor complain ourselves out of our lot. Has anyone ever tried that? <laughs> I have. Life stinks. As soon as I say that, it changed 100% and I had all the money I needed. It's never helped. Never. Complaining about it, praying about it, nothing changes it. The lot stays there. I look at it, it's the same lot. It is sovereignly fixed unless God decides to change it. In the meantime, we must learn to accept our lot, enjoy our lot, make the most of our lot, give thanks for our lot. Amen? Amen. At the end of verse 19a, Colette says, God enables enjoyment by his power. Wow. I, I, Colette's always flexing the sovereignty of God. It's just amazing. This literally means that God is, is, is you know, he's the, he's the source of all things. He's, he's the source of our lot. He's also the source of joy. And he's also the enabler of enjoyment, that he brings enjoyment through things. We know that in his presence there is the fullness of joy at his right hand. There are really true pleasures forevermore. Psalm 1611. You know, I've got a, a friend who... Um, He's always complimenting, I love the guy, he's always complimenting the universe for meeting his needs. Last time I checked, the only thing the universe can deliver up is an asteroid to the face. Somehow, he always accredits the universe with whatever he has. It's a bizarre thing, and it's kind of, it's been around forever. People have been worshiping the creation forever, Romans 1. We know this, but it's bizarre to hear that. Have you been hearing that too lately? Like, everyone's always talking about the universe and, you know, believe you deserve it, the universe will serve it. <laughs> As if the universe is the sovereign over our lives, listening to us, knowing our needs. We're, we're talking about a God here. The universe is not the source nor the giver of anything nor good things. The good things we see and enjoy in the universe are not from the universe. They're from the creator who put those things in the universe. When a person praises the universe for their provision, they are worshiping creation instead of the creator. They are revealing that they are futile in their thinking, foolish in their hearts, and dark in Romans 1, 21 and verse 25. I'm not trying to hammer my friend. I'm just trying to say that you're, you're giving... Credit, where credit is not due, the universe isn't doing diddly squat for you. It's part of creation just as you are. And anything good that you find in the universe or find in creation or find in the world was put there for you by God. Give praise where it's due. Creation is created. No created thing can satisfy our deeper spiritual needs. The earth is not the end game. The tree huggers, the climate zealots, all that big group of very zealous people who are trying to, trying to save the world, they're wrong about all of this. Like everything else, our planet should be seen as a divine gift. And it should be explored 
established, which means developed for the benefit of mankind. You, you know why there's third world nations that are so repressed and so dry and don't have, they don't, they don't maximize and develop their territories. You can find water anywhere, but they don't dig to find it. They don't develop, they don't steward and develop what they have before them. That's a sad situation, don't get me wrong. But it's meant to be explored, established, and enjoyed by mankind, especially Christians. You have to recognize the source of wealth, of riches, and of joy, and of enjoyment, and of all things. You have to recognize where it's all coming from if you're going to have a right theology, view, perspective, or understanding of anything in life, especially riches. You've got to know it's coming from God. If, if, if I know it's coming from God, then I can see it as a gift to be enjoyed, not something turned into an idol, not something turned into something that I would actually put my trust in. I need to trust the source, not the supply. Amen? You're not gonna, you can't get there if we're hanging on to these old depraved views. We've got to see, we've, we've got to see the source properly. We've got to see the strategy properly. So the second thing we must do is recognize the source of riches. It's God. He's the providential provider. He's the gracious giver of all good things, riches, joy, enjoyment, and so on. Everything's coming from him. Let's move to my ninth and final observation for today. Lastly, and this, this is huge, and this goes with the whole lot thing that he just talked about, right? He's the source of our lot, too. Where you're at, what you have, what you're doing is from him. Complain your way out of it, never going to happen. Number nine, recognize the suitability of riches, verses 19b to 20. 19b is where I'll go first, and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. So, Coelet is basically saying in light of a fallen world and everything else that's going on and how vain and meaningless everything is and everything, and trusting in wealth, how futile that is and all that, he says the best thing a person can do is just accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. Why? He says right at the end of the verse 19b, because it's a gift of God. It's a gift. The lot that you live in is a gift. The resources that you have are a gift. The enjoyment is a gift. It's all a gift. Remember, if everything's coming from God and it's coming to people who aren't worthy of anything except wrath, it has to be a gift. Amen? Everyone talks about salvation as a gift. It is. It's a free gift. You can't earn it. But so is breathing. So is a bank account. So is a car. So is a pet named Heidi. So is water bottle on the back table with Robin. So is getting your teeth clean and it hurts. Everything is a gift. Sorry, Robin. Robin's like, why do you bring that up? I don't know. Don't tell me what you're going through right before I preach. Right? So is a colonoscopy, because somebody just told me, pray, I'm going in for one. It's like, that entered into the sermon. It's a gift. It's a, gift. <laughs> it's a, it's a wonderful gift. Yeah. Some things are clearly not as fun. Best thing you can do is accept your lot, rejoice in your toil. It's a gift from God. Since God gives only good and perfect gifts, Everything he sends to us is superbly suited for us. God's gifts are tailor-made for each individual. Did you hear what I just said? If you feel as if and think that where you're at in life isn't really suitable for where you would want to be, you're, you're now undermining the one who has determined your suitability because he knows you better than you know yourself. Yes, our spouse is suited for us. Really? Yeah. Our family is suited for us. You got 3.2 kids. I don't know what the point two is doing, but or whatever they say, 2.2, whatever that dumb thing is. Our friends are suited for us. Hmm. Our home is suited for us. Our careers are suited for us. Our riches are suited for us. Our possessions are suited for us. 
Our joy is suited for us. Our enjoyment of good things is suited for us. Yes, 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 yes. No, we, we are not robots, automatons. We're nothing like that. But make no mistake, God is far more sovereign and involved in our lives than we may want to think. He is imminent. What does that mean? It means he plays an active role in the world, especially in the lives of people, his people and unbelievers. For example, Proverbs 16, 9. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Proverbs 21, 1. The king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. These are examples of God's sovereignty in the lives of people. Unbeliever or believer alike, he's active. Our lot... Going back to Lot, because he's still on that thought. Our Lot is the product of God's infinite wisdom and omniscience. That he knows all things. With the ultimate goals being his glory and our good. Do you rejoice in your Lot and see it as God's good for you? Because that's what you're supposed to do. When we enjoy and rejoice over what we have, who we have in our lives, what we have, God is literally glorified and worshipped. It proves that we have not only accepted our lot from him, but that we are thankful for the lot he has given us. But if a person can find no enjoyment in their lot, it's not God's fault because his gifts are good and perfect. It's their fault because they have failed to recognize the strategy, the source and the suitability of riches, or your lot. Despising our lot is tantamount to despising its sovereign source. And this is why discontentment is so utterly repulsive in the eyes of God. Numbers 11.1. 1. What is discontentment? It's not being happy with your lot, thinking you should have more or less or whatever. That is a direct attack against his wisdom and goodness. It would be hurtful. Now, let me ask you a question. Wouldn't it be hurtful to have a beloved friend reject a thoughtful gift from us? Would that not feel like a stab through the heart? Would it? Ask yourself. You have something that, that maybe you saved for. You put a lot of thought into it. It's tailor-made for that kind of person. You don't give a person who's into this something that's the opposite of that. It's not going to translate. If they're a Disney fan, you would give them something Disney-related mountain biking, whatever it is. So you have a friend that you love and care for, and you want to give them a gift because you love them, and so you put some thought into it, and it tra it's going to translate well because it's what they're into, right? Now, if you went over to Sally, I've used her before. Poor Sally. There's Sally's in the world that are crying right now. You go to Sally, and you give her this gift. I don't want this piece of junk. Mm. Amen? Why would it be any different if we're complaining about our lot to the one who gave it to us? I think that it's safe to assume God isn't crushed by us, but he is an emotional God. That's why we have emotions. He is a God of joy. That's why we have joy. I think it's safe to assume that it would hurt his feelings if we were to turn away a thoughtful, meaningful, perfectly suited gift for us. You know, God provided the greatest gift to humanity that will ever be known. His one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ. You know what people have done with that? Spin on it. Hebrews 10, it describes how God responds to those who spurn that gracious gift. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the Lord. Hebrews 10, 26. I am a God of vengeance. I will repay, it says. I think it's safe to assume that the rejection of such a costly gift is going to come at a cost to those who reject it. And I think it's safe to say that if any of us are fighting our circumstances and situation, even if they're challenging and difficult. It's our lot for now, and it's meant for our ultimate good and His glory. If we're going to fight that, it's got to be offensive to the one who gave it. Why can't we say to ourselves, well, He knows what's best. He really does. I believe that. 
You know, if you believe in God, you have to believe he knows what's best. Why can't we say that and say, I accept where I'm at. I'm going to rejoice over it as best I can. Lord, help me with it. Instead of saying, I don't want to do this. Jonah. Well, go ahead and get thrown off the boat and swallowed by a blue whale. I think we stab God through the heart when we're unwilling to accept and rejoice and thank him for our lot. Even if it's by our own, our own standards, doesn't seem like it's the best lot. So the third thing that we must do is recognize the suitability of riches. And what does that really mean? It means you're as rich as God wants you to be. <laughs> Amen? What you have is suitable for you, coming from the one who knows you better than you will ever know yourself. You have exactly what he's intended for you to have. No more, no less. What you have is suitable for you and your family. If there's a deficit and it's short, check yourself. Don't check him. If you're not happy with it, imagine how that might translate to the one who provided for you. Cliche saying, count your blessings. It's time to start counting our blessings. Gosh, as bad as a day can be, you can stop and think about all the other days that you had that were so wonderful. Perspective is everything. Amen? And, and, and I don't mean this in a cruel way, but there's always somebody we know or somebody in our community or somebody in our state or somebody in our county, somebody in our state, somebody in, 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 in our country, somebody in the world that's not, it's just not enjoying things the way we are. Now, I don't look at that and say, well, I have it so much better. That's sad. But I can at least look and see that some lots that God has given are much more challenging. And here I am whining about mine. In that guy's lot, they don't have water. Dig, buddy. They don't get it. Maybe we can help people with their lot. Maybe that's what God wants. Point being. Don't, don't. Look, man, believe if your lot isn't where you would like it to be and what you're asking for can bring God glory and honor, then pray that he would help you work your way into a better lot. Part of the lot that God gives does come through our own hard work, but it's all from him. I've always said this, you know, because as a pastor, you'll have a thousand people tell you I'm not happy with my, where my life is. You know what I say? Change it. What, what do you? I'm just waiting for God to change it. He gave you a brain. He gave you skills. He gave you logic. That's not even in people today. He gave you a rational mind. Put it to use. You're tired of working over here? Get a different job. But ultimately, the lot is from him. And if it changes, it's because he's allowed that. And maybe the change will come through you changing jobs. It's all relative. Everything we have is tailored for us. That's the suitability. People, places, possessions. Our lot is custom made for us by the hand of God. You know what is beautiful about God? One of the things that's beautiful about him, I mean, everything's beautiful about him, but one thing that's beautiful about him is he's not a track home developer. Christians. That's not what he does. None of us are the same. I'm a three-bedroom. Daryl's a four-bedroom. Daryl only has one bathroom, though. I have six. We're all different. We're, there's no cookie cutter here, guys. We're not all the same. We don't all have the same shade of skin tone. We don't all have the same uh, things that we laugh at and enjoy. We're all different. God is wires. There's this beauty in the diversity of God in creation, especially in people. And so we're not cookie cutters. And so what is suitable for me may not be suitable for you. This is one of the things that we really wrestle with as fallen people, right? Even if we're redeemed and saved, we want that guy's lot. And now that is, again, a rejection of what God has made suitable for you. Be careful with this stuff. Let's not offend our gracious God. Our lot is custom made for us by his own hand, for he has sovereignly 
determined allotted periods and boundaries of our dwelling place in him we live, move, and have our being, Acts 17, 26 and verse 28. In the final verse of chapter 25, Colette describes the person who applies biblical wisdom. In other words, the person who recognizes and, and applies and lives out the strategy, source, and suitability of riches, and obviously abandons the trust in wealth. Verse 20, this is, this is what you have to look forward to if, if, if you don't just hear the word of God, but do it. Okay? Verse 20, speaking of the same person, for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Oh, man. Coelette tells us that God will keep the person who applies this wisdom, who lives this wisdom, who recognizes these simple things, strategy, source, and suitability of riches, complies with that, surrenders to that, and says, hey, it's all God. He's got a strategy for it. It's coming from him. He's made it suitable for me. The person who applies and lives out that wisdom, God, what is he going to do for that person? Keep that person occupied with joy in his heart, so much so that he's hardly going to, if at all, remember the toil-filled, troublesome days of his life. That's what he's saying. In other words, God's joy will be deeply implanted in that person, and it will accompany that person in whatever he does, in wherever she goes, the joy will be there. And when stresses anxieties and exhaustion arises, divine joy that's deeply implanted will overrule them. Now we're starting to get into that realm of the peace that transcends understanding and stuff. You know, when you're going through something and you have this peace and this joy about you, even though you just lost a loved one, yes, of course you're mourning, of course you're grieved, you hurt, but there's something about you that's different. You're not grieving like the rest of the world. That's what we're talking about here. Divine joy overrules these things. Sure, they're there, but they don't take us captive and ruin us. This person who has this joy of the Lord because they've recognized and they're practicing these things, he or she, they're not going to be taken captive by anything or anyone because they are filled and guarded by divine joy. In other words, this person's lot and life is going to be enjoyable because they have joy. Even when things aren't perfect, when storms rage, when thieves rob. <laughs> the other night, I guess I left my, my car open. I didn't have anything of value in it, but I left it open, and somebody decided to use it as a pup tent. When I got in it the next day, my seat was all the way back. The door was cracked open. Somebody slept in my car. And then, I don't know, one of my kids said, did you disinfect it afterwards? I said, no, I just got in it and put my stink back in it. We're good. I just got back in there and it became me again. It overruled whatever they had. And, of course, I wear a bottle of cologne every day, so it's okay. But when thieves rob, when storms crash all over us, God's joy will remain. God's joy is unshakable and unspeakable. John 16, 22, 1 Peter 1, 8. The one who has, who possesses it in their, in their soul, in their heart, in the center of who they are, they're going to be like the city of God, unmoved. Psalm 46, 5. If we will recognize the strategy of riches, they are given for a great many things, but in particular in this context, for our enjoyment. If we will recognize the source of riches, God is the sovereign giver. Everything is coming from his hand. If we will recognize the suitability of riches, everything we have is tailored and custom made for us. Our lot, our riches, our families, our homes, whatever we have. And we will abandon our trust in wealth or in any other idol. God will keep us occupied with joy in our hearts. And life itself will become less irritating and far more enjoyable. Amen? Divine joy, last thought. Divine joy does this. It produces thick skin. It softens a person in the right way and hardens them in the right way. It softens them and makes them sensitive to others and to the Lord and sensitive to people's circumstances 
It brings about an empathy. This is what the joy of the Lord does. But it also hardens us against everything in the world that wants to destroy the joy. When you have the joy of the Lord in your heart because you're actually living for him. If you wanted to boil it all down and say living for him, that, that's what this is. When you have that in you, it, it, it allows troubles and travails and tribulations to roll off of you like never before. And it's not that you're a fatalist and just dismiss things. They just don't get at you like they did before. Amen? Terry, you know. I know. We know this. We've lived this. We've lived this. Who hasn't lived this? Bernie, you're the captain of this team. Lead us forth. Divine joy brings thick skin. Difficulties will roll off us like never before. May we believe and apply God's word, God's wisdom, what we see here in this text, always for his glory and then for our good. Amen.